So, Mr. Ambassador, Avi, thank you so much for hosting me here and allowing me to come here to the Israeli embassy to talk to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you over here and thank you for coming. And thank you. It's uh, our, I would first like to extend my deepest condolences to you and to the Israeli people after the horrible atrocities of the 7th of October in your country. It's, uh, it's difficult to put into words and I, I don't even know which words to use, but I, I would just like to say that uh, I have my deepest condolences. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. How has the the latest uh, six, seven weeks been for you uh, in this time? Well, you know, for us, it's one long day that started on uh, early morning, uh, October 7th. And since then, it's like it's the same day, uh, continuing and continuing uh, with a lot of challenges, a lot of sadness, a lot of... Uh, soul search in a way of trying to see what went wrong but this will be answer after the war will be over but right now to try to see how we're winning this war because we've been facing and we are still facing the hardest day since we've been able to regain our independence never before since 1948 we were facing such days and we've been facing the uh, most cruel atrocities that we've been facing since the, the holocaust and we're still having uh, hostages in gaza uh, more than 130 of them, and we're still having 17 women and, and kids in Gaza. Um, it's like a nightmare that uh, we didn't wake up from. That's the situation. It's also it's like unprecedented because you had lots of attacks, I assume, from, from Hamas and from these different groups all the time, but this is something completely different uh, in a different nature. Uh, was this... Because uh, I've been thinking about the how, how could this happen also because I'm thinking like Israeli intelligence, you have the Mossad, you have the United States, you have, uh, I watched the TV series Fauda, you know, I, I assume like Israel has a top level intelligence, you know everything about everything and I just, I, I can't understand how this could happen. So I believe that there's no lack of intelligence. I believe that we should see uh, all the new warning lights in front of us and they were there. I believe that the reason that we missed it was a misconception. And it was interesting because it was taking place 7th of October, one day after the 50th anniversary of the 73 war of the Yom Kippur war. And Yom Kippur war was the same. There was a misconception because we had all the signs in front of us and we misread them. And we misread them because we want to believe in peace. We misread them because we want to live quiet life, both for us and the Palestinians. And we wanted to believe that there's a gap between the Hamas leadership abroad, the uh, military wing of the Hamas in uh, Gaza, and the government of Hamas in Gaza. We wanted really to believe that the government of Hamas in, of, in Gaza really care about the people of the life of the people that they are living, the, the people of Gaza. And we saw all kinds of signs of warning signs on one hand. On the other hand, we saw uh, the Hamas uh, government in Gaza really trying to export terrorism for us from Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, instead of from Gaza. And we read it as that they want also to have a peaceful coexistence, not necessarily for the long run, for this benefit of their own people. We misread it. And this is why we had this misconception. This is why probably we had this failure, because we had all the warning lights in front of us. And we were seeing, you know, Salah Hawari, one of the leaders of Hamas abroad, they couldn't care less about the Palestinians in Gaza. They, they're willing to sacrifice them and they're saying it. Give, the, give, us our, give us the blood of your children, the blood of your women. We need it for the spirit of the revolution. What spirit of revolution? Islamic revolution. And he was, after being uh, asked to leave Istanbul because he was finding refuge in Istanbul for many years, he was asked to leave Istanbul. And he was finding refuge in uh, Beirut. And we've seen him meeting on a regular basis with Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, and meeting with the commander of the Quds Force, the Iranian Quds Force. Uh, and we are saying, we are saying they are planning a multi-front attack on Israel. We said it, and we didn't understand what we are saying. It's... I must assume that it's also difficult because you're probably getting... Uh, I just assume that you're getting threats all the time in Israel and you have to you have to discern which threats to act on because, because you probably can't act on everything all the time because yeah. you wouldn't be doing anything else. So it must be really difficult, I guess, also in that sense. Um, but uh, what would you say is the new kinds, uh, the new nature of this attack versus previous attacks on Israel? 
I guess that this time you can see for sure things that we not necessarily we've been able to say before that uh, the Palestinian cause is not important to Hamas at all. They didn't serve the Palestinian cause in any way. They were sacrificing the people of uh, Gaza. If before we could say, you know, this is the government of Hamas, it's their organization, but still they care, care about the Palestinian people, they're taking care of about their education, about the medical condition and so on. Nothing in this attack. Anyone that was organizing it couldn't see, I don't believe that they could see that in any way they are serving the well-being of the Palestinians. Basically, they were sacrificing them for two causes. One is the Iranian cause, because at the end of the day, Hamas is a proxy of Iran. Hamas, like Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, like the Shia militias in Syria, like the Houthis in Yemen, uh, all of them are proxies of uh, Iran and serving the regional goals of Iran, the regional interest of Iran. This is one. Second is, there are Muslim brotherhoods. Muslim brotherhoods do not believe in, in a nation as a nation. They want to have an Islamic uh, rule over the Middle East. That's the goal. It has nothing to do with the Palestinian uh, national aspiration, and they were sacrificing them. So basically, the, uh, Iran is sacrificing the people of uh, Gaza for their own sake. They are sacrificing the people of Lebanon for their own sake. This is part of the regional, really, uh, struggle of Iran. And this is what, this was the difference. This was the first time that we saw Hamas, always they've been proxy of Iran. But this time they were really sacrificing the people of Gaza for goals that has nothing to do with the Palestinian people. And also it was like, um, because I think a lot of people has difficulty in in the, the moral nuances of what warfare is, because I was thinking um, of the hierarchy of warfare, like on top you might have soldiers who comply with uh, the re- regulations of the laws of war. So they're not there, they're not soldiers, this is not warfare. So underneath that you have terrorism, people who want to strike fear in the public who do lots of attacks, but I, I don't think that is the right word covering it either. Mm-hmm. So I think underneath that, further down towards hell, you have sadism where they just where they just have they want to kill people just for the pleasure of killing they want to they want to see people hurting they want to just see death for the pleasure of death i think that is the category that we're that we're seeing here with hamas and i think it's perhaps difficult for people just to accept that kind of evil exists at all i think it's a difficult concept to 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 accept in general, what you're seeing in the uh, ongoing conflicts between us and Hamas, and I have to say, this is not a war between Israel and the Palestinians. Yes, Palestinians are getting harm in this war, but this is a war between us and Hamas. We have nothing against the Palestinians, we don't want to harm them. But all along, all along those years, what was happening is that we were playing on two different fields, or so playing on the same, very, very, in the very same field, but with two different uh, set of rules. Basically, they are uh, in a street fight. Everything is allowed, all no rules at all, uh, and we are demanded to uh, play like we are in a ballet competition. And you having two sets of rules, and the international community is judging us according to two different sets of rules. And what you've seen of October seven. It's not only the brutality that they were having. This was the brutality was part of the the, the, the tactic. Raping women is part of, of the tactic. Not raping necessarily only because of the raping, but we want to create fear. We want to harm you. Uh, but even before this, because every time they were shooting rockets on Israel and every time that the suitcase with money from Qatar wouldn't come on time, they would shoot rockets. And it's not that, you know, uh, Israel is being... Uh, Every time being a judge, is it according to the laws of uh, war or not? They, every time that they're shooting rockets, they're just shooting it, shooting into a civilian population, and then nobody's saying anything. And when uh, October 17th, when the Al-Hilal hospital was hit by Islamic Jihad, not by us, immediately over here in Norway, a member of the starting were blaming us for a war crime. Uh, I was still asking the foreign ministry to call me to criticize Israel. The next morning, when apparently they found out it wasn't Israel, it wasn't interesting anymore. It wasn't a war crime anymore. It wasn't interesting. But in Israel, Hamas hit the same hospital in Ashkelon three times, the Barzillai hospital. Nobody in Norway was saying anything about it. This is okay. When Hamas is hitting hospitals three times, this is not a war crime. But when Israel is not hitting, but they can blame Israel, this is a war crime. Why do you think that is? Why the discrepancy between how people view Hamas and Palestine versus Israel. Why is it like that? 
It's a very good question, and I don't have the answer. I believe that this is an answer to ask the people that are, are acting like this. And this is not only when it's about Israel and the Palestinians. I'm asking myself, how much those people really support the Palestinians? Because, you know, during the civil war in Syria, there was a, a refugee camp, a Palestinian refugee camp in uh, Syria. 80% of it was wiped out by uh, Assad. You didn't see anyone protesting in the street of Oslo on behalf of the Palestinians, which means they don't care about the Palestinians. What they want to is to criticize Israel. And also, um, I'm so ashamed of uh, Norway in this situation because we, we are actually worse than other Western European countries in our lack of support of Israel. And I don't really understand why. Like even Denmark has much more support for Israel's cause in this, uh, as are the prime minister there, who are really supportive and standing strong with, with Israel and also in Germany. And so the defense minister had a speech on, on Twitter, X, where he said very clearly that we will stand with Israel and uh, we will protect Israel. And why, why the discrepancy from Norway to the other Western European countries? You know, I don't want even... Uh Norway to stand by Israel is standing by Israel. What I want really is to stand by the truth and the facts. Uh, if Israel deserves to be criticized, Israel deserves to be criticized. But what we're seeing over here is that from early stage, Norway was the first country in Europe uh, to blame Israel for uh, breaking the international law. We didn't. When you're listening uh, uh, the political leadership, they will say that Israel is breaking the international law. International law. But international law is based on facts, not on assumption and not about feelings. And then when you're listening to most of the international law experts in Norway, they will say that either that Israel is not breaking the international law, or they will say that it's, there are not any proof to prove that Israel really were breaking the international law. So why is it happening? If it's coming from political leadership and it's not coming from the expert, probably there's a little a political motivation over there. And for me, this is said. Again, I'm saying if Israel will be wrong, it would be right to criticize it, not on political uh, ground. And also, if somebody is breaking international laws and regulations, that would be a case for the ICC uh, to have in a court. You can't just walk around and have the justice done on the streets just by hearsay and just by rumors and everybody's walking around saying who's doing what. You have to do this by legal standards. You know, <clears throat> even if you'll see someone in the street, killing someone else, you'll arrest this person, you'll investigate the case, you'll bring it to court, and as you say, only the court will decide what is the verdict. And if, uh, over here, people are uh, throwing blames against Israel, and they don't need to prove them, but this is okay to say that Israel is uh, breaking the international law, People in the street are blaming us for uh, atrocities, uh, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and this is all okay. This is all okay. And I'm saying, you know what? On October 7th, we've been waking up, realizing our position, realizing that we can trust really ourselves and we should trust ourselves, uh, and realize that some societies should ask themselves, what is really happening? Because it has nothing to do with Israel. It should, it's what's about happening in those societies inside. So we will uh, be strong. We will uh, recover from the October 7th. Some, so some societies should have really to look deep into them, see what's happening in the media, see what's happening uh, in some other places in the society, and ask themselves, how did we, not Israel, how we as society came to this kind of places? Because also what I find so absurd is that you know, people are actually blaming the victim in, in this situation because Israel is the country that got attacked by a horrible, atrocious acts who, who weren't even, there weren't even soldiers from Hamas attacking Israeli soldiers or attacking IDF. That would be at least a little bit better yeah. morally. But they weren't that, doing that. They were attacking kids and families and women yeah. in the kibbutz. It's like those are those aren't even soldiers. Don't they don't have any weapons? You're just killing them just to kill. Yeah. And and how many twelve hundred people? Uh, yeah. As the last last count, and 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 for what? Why? How, how did that gain their cause? How did that change everything? How did that bring about any form of peace? This was a bloody terrorist attack on Israel, and then the whole world is gathering 
not the whole world, but a lot of people are gathering against Israel after that. That's just so absurd. People should rally around your right to self-defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, la at least some people in Norway are, are uh, <laughs> speaking up for that as well, but they are the minority of people in the, in the daily news media. But, uh, but you have an obvious right to self-defense. And, and of course, Israel can't live with an organization like Hamas on the other side of the fence. You can't live, you, you can't, I, I understand that Netanyahu and the government can't accept having that risk happening one more time. And also the, they've said that not only did they do that, but they will promise that they will do it again and right. again and again and again. And which country, which government could accept that kind of risk for their inhabitants? So, you know, we're hearing also over here that, you know, it's Netanyahu and his extreme right-wing government. It's not about Netanyahu and the government and it doesn't matter how you tag this government. This is the whole people of Israel. Israel is united as it's never been for many, many years before. I was in Boston when it was starting. I was reaching Boston on October 6th. Evening, 7th of October, I was waking up from the news from Israel, making my way back directly to uh, Oslo. You had 240,000 Israelis doing the same, coming back to Israel immediately in order to join the efforts to win this war, to volunteer in places that there's a need to volunteer. 300,000 Israelis are being drafted to the reservist of the army, joining right now the war. It's not about Netanyahu, or about the government. This is about the people of Israel realizing exactly what you said. As President Biden was saying, the status quo of October 6th cannot repeat itself. We cannot have Hamas as a government in Gaza anymore because they proved what they've been able to do. Killing babies, burning babies, tying kids to their parents with wire and then burning them alive, burning houses down to ensure that those people that were hiding in the security room will have to escape and then they will shoot them, raping women, uh, kidnapping uh, 200, uh, roughly 240 people among them, the youngest one is still not released and we hope that he's alive. He was then nine months old, already two months in captivity. Uh, we don't know if they're alive or not alive. It's with, together with his mother and together with his four years old brother. Who is taking hostages those kind of kids? And as you said, they're appearing later on on, on TV, on, on camera, and saying we will repeat it and repeat it again and again until Israel will cease to exist. Now, I don't understand why anyone is asking us to have a ceasefire with such organization with Norway itself. We're not willing to agree to have Al-Qaeda existing and you send your soldiers all the way to Afghanistan to a different continent to fight organization that it's clear that everybody agreed that it shouldn't exist, neither Al-Qaeda, neither the ISIS, but Israel, when we're having Hamas across the fence and we saw what this fence is, was, was like, we had the bulldozer opening it, tearing it apart, and, and thousands of people are rushing into Israel. Why Israel is demanding to be uh, willing to accept such organization, such a bloody uh, jihadist radical organization across the fence? We didn't ask for this war, but we're going to protect ourselves. And why is Israel being called to agree to a ceasefire? Why don't we hear the uh, governments around the, uh, the, the world calling Hamas to lay down their arm? If tomorrow morning, in a perfect world, Hamas will lay down their arms, will leave Gaza, Israel have no reason to be in Gaza. We have nothing against the Palestinian people. We'll be happy to cease this war. But it's not about us, it's about Hamas. And why don't we hear, you know, everybody is about Israel and Gaza, but there's masterminds behind it, which is Iran. Why don't we hear governments around the world calling Tehran and telling them, tell your proxy, to seize immediately with their actions. And if not, we will expel your ambassadors from our capitals. We don't hear it. Over here, people are calling to expel me. Why don't we hear the same call to expel the Iranian ambassadors from all over the world, unless Iran is telling Hamas, seize your hostilities, give up. You are not a legitimate government. There's no such a call. Uh, I was going to ask you about Iran because some people have explained to me like, uh, the 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 metaphor of an octopus like mm -hmm. like Iran is a big octopus and one of its arms is Hamas another arm is Hezbollah um, another arm is Palestinian Authority and how much of that picture do you think is true is Iran behind all of this stuff is uh, are they supporting it or are, are they actually the mastermind creating or the plans for doing all of these kinds of terror attacks. 
They don't have hundred percent control on Hamas or hundred percent percent control on Hezbollah, but very close to hundred percent. And for I guess that the best example for it is the Houthis in Yemen. What does the Houthis in Yemen has to do with Israel, and why they've been attacking us with almost forty ballistic missiles since the war started, and hitting a school in Elad, the southern city in Israel, with a drone from Yemen? Where does people have uh, the money to uh, produce those uh, ballistic missiles? Where is it coming from? They are attacking uh, commercial ships on the Red Sea. Why? What does it have to do if it's not for Iranian interest? So Iran, you know, they're sitting quietly in uh, Tehran, enjoying peaceful uh, situation and sacrificing, as I said, all those countries around us for their own interest. What does the Houthis have to do with us? It's all about Iran. How important do you feel the United States, uh, the support from the United States is to Israel? It's very important. And uh, I guess that, as I said, we had a misconception. On 7th of October, we had a misconception. We knew that the threat is there, but we believe that it's not going to happen because they care about their own people. Hamas also had a misconception. They believe that we are a week because of the demonstration in Israel. We had 39 weeks of demonstration in Israel because we are a democracy and we believe that the way to change things if you are not happy, it's by demonstration. They are not a democratic society. They didn't understand that, you know, at the moment of truth, if somebody, if our existence is going to be threatened, people will be united immediately, which what this is what was happening. They are hoping, hoping that they will attack us and well, they will be attacking us. Hezbollah will join from Lebanon, uh, uh, Shia militias from Iran, Houthis, but also the uh, Palestinian people from the West Bank will attack Israel, and the Israeli Arabs will join them as well, and Israel will collapse and cease to exist. They had their own misconception. So basically, it, it could always happen if President Biden, not that it will collapse, they will have other joining. It, it could happen if President Biden would, wouldn't be going very quickly on camera. And I'm, I was saying that, you know, anyone else that want to join this war, I have only one word for you. But he's, he was repeating this word three times. He said, don't, don't, don't. And immediately he was sending also two aircraft carriers uh, to the region. Uh, UK was sending also uh, two uh, warships to the region. And I believe that this was what's stopping really Hezbollah from joining for a full war. We can talk about Hezbollah in a second, but we are in exchange of fire with them, almost on a daily basis, but this is not a full war. Probably without the Americans, will be, they will be joining for a full war. Now, the Americans are there with a very important moral support to Israel, legitimacy for Israel, and also we need them really in the international arena to stop any uh, steps against Israel, because, you know, uh, take, for example, the Security Council in the UN. UN is totally biased, totally biased. Uh, if without the veto of the US, we might not be able to, to do what we're doing right now. So the US is very important. We very much appreciate uh, the very strong support of President Biden and his administration, but it's coming really uh, from wide spectrum of the American uh, political arena, not only from the, the administration, as well as the friendship of President Biden to Israel. He's a real friend of Israel. Um, also, I remember previously before Biden, you had Trump who did also a lot of things for Israel. He moved the embassy to yeah. Jerusalem and also tried to get these Abraham Accords uh, that you were about to sign, I guess, with Saudi Arabia before this. How much of this do you think is is the cause of Hamas doing this, that you were about to get into agreements with Saudi Arabia? I believe that the timing was really around this normalization because I believe that Hamas was... Uh, worried that the normalization is going very quickly. And if they wouldn't be doing it right now, it would be too late and they won't be able to stop it anymore. We've seen it, you know, 30 years ago. We've seen it with the Oslo Accords. People were talking about the Oslo Accord and, and again, many, many are blaming Israel for the failure of the Oslo Accord. What they don't realize is, or what they tend to forget is that the two years before the Oslo Accord, only seven Israelis only. Every one person that is being killed is a lot, but seven Israelis were killed in the tours before the Oslo Accord by terror uh, attacks. The tours after the Oslo Accord, while well, Rabin is still prime minister, Shimon Peres is a prime minister, 147 Israelis were murdered by terror attack by Hamas. 
which wanted to derail the Oslo Accord, and they were successful. So it wasn't about the idea of Oslo, it was about uh, the process that was derailed totally by terror attack by Hamas. This is what they are trying to do right now with the Saudis. I believe that they're wrong, because I believe that, you know, uh, when the country in the region is saying the evilness that is coming under the uh, spirit of Iran, it will just encourage them even further to have better relations with Israel because they realize that the enemy is not Israel. They realize that Israel is a partner for a stable Middle East, while Iran is the one that they should be really careful from. Are you afraid about uh, the possibility of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons? You cannot trust Iran on anything. But I really believe that uh, for many years, the problem with Iran is really uh, that the main export that they're having is terror and death in the Middle East. You don't only, only necessarily have to have uh, the nuclear weapon. It's enough to see what they are doing. And you know, when you're looking at the Middle East, most of the Muslims in the Middle East in the last 20 years probably, were murdered by Muslims, other Muslims. When you're looking at the, for, at the civil war in Syria, roughly 600,000 people were uh, murdered over there, killed over there. So people will say, yes, this was Al-Qaeda. No, majority of them have been killed by uh, President Assad himself and his, those that assisted him, which was Iran and Hezbollah. Those are the ones that were killing the, most, the biggest number of Syrian people in the civil war in Syria. Uh, so Iran is, is a vicious country spreading a lot of this all over the world, not only in the Middle East, also in uh, Europe. You had cases that uh, different uh, terror attacks were taking care, uh, taking, uh, carrying out because of Iran, and also some places in uh, Latin America as well. I want to speak about also anti-Semitism, because how much of this attack do you feel, or the war, how much of this is a war of land areas and uh, regional power and how much is this actually a war about anti-semitism i would separate between the two things what's happening right now between us and the uh, hamas it says to do with uh, really jihadist uh, ideology in the middle east and it's not necessarily about anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism, but this jihadist ideology is threatening the West as a, in general, not only Israel. So uh, we've seen the attack in Brussels during the game, before the game between Sweden and uh, Belgium, the two Swedish were uh, murdered over there. It wasn't about anti-Semitism, it was about jihadism. We saw the attack in Paris uh, the day before yesterday, this was about jihadism, it wasn't about uh, anti-Semitism. Still, anti-Semitism was growing rapidly since the war started, especially after the false accusation on Israel uh, against Israel on October 17th that we were the one to bomb the hospital. And there's a big, frightening wave of uh, anti-Semitism in the world. Um, as I said, Israel is strong enough. Jewish communities are citizens of their own country. Even if you are the devil, even if you are the devil, none of them should be attacked for what we are doing. If you're having a German citizens that happen to be Jews, they are German citizens. If you're having Norwegian citizens that happen to be Jews, they are Norwegians. So even if we are wrong, it's not their fault. So what we're seeing, the attacks against Jews around the world, this is pure anti-Semitism. It's not necessarily what's happening in between us and the Hamas right now. What do you think about in the level in Norway? Do you find that there's more and more growing anti-Semitism here? Well, it's for the Jewish community to answer, not for me, but we've seen the, the recent survey that was just published that's saying uh, that many of them feel that uh, there's a growing anti-Semitism and growing fear for, for their, uh, their existence over here, and, and they're afraid to reveal that they are Jews, and they are taking off uh, Jewish symbols. And it was interesting to see that 96% of them believe that the media has a great uh, role in their feeling over here because the media is biased. So it was interesting and it's, it's disturbing. In a way, it's disturbing because, you know, Nor is enjoying the prestige, rightly probably, of having a free media, the number one country in the world with a free media. But the problem between free media and uh, freedom of expression is that you're allowed to voice very limited uh, specific voices, and if you don't say what people are expecting from you, uh, you're either afraid to say it, or you're being critical, or you're being criticized, or you're being bullied for what you said. 
So this is not freedom of expression. You, if, you, if you're supposed to say something that everybody wants you to say, this is not freedom of expression. You can be critical to Israel, this is okay. But you can also support to Israel without being bullied, and this is not happening. I don't understand why, how we came there, how we, how we got there in Norway. <laughs> I thought we had a freedom of press. I thought we had the the opportunity to say what we thought, but it's like you're saying, we have a very narrow window of what we can say, and also a lot of political correctness and also a lot of peer pressure yeah. to what is acceptable. And I wonder why that is. I wonder perhaps in the different um, newspapers and uh, at the different desks, you have a lot of people who actually are in support of Palestine. And perhaps that in itself is just, Just that fact is is defining how the media is portraying this whole situation, but just by the people working there. So this might be one of the things, and and you have a lot of people that uh, you know. You, when you're seeing, you know, in the media and in the university, whenever you have a debate on the Middle East, you'll always have people for that coming with one specific voice that is critical to Israel, and you won't have the other voices as well. Also in the academy, I mean, you cannot have a real debate if you don't have the two sides, but it's happening over here. We're going to have such a debate in the University of Oslo, uh, I believe it's next week. Uh, nobody that is will protect Israel will be there. Everybody will be, all those figures that you know that will be critical about Israel. Um, but besides, even if you have people that want to voice a different voice in the media, they know that they'll be uh, criticized very quickly, so they prefer, you know, why should I go out of lines? Why should I risk my position? Why should I be criticized? So they wouldn't dare to say or to, to uh, have a different voice, even if, if, even if they want to have a different voice. Hmm. It's, uh, I think it's important for democracy and the situation in particular, but also for Norwegian values, like to remember here in Norway what we stand for. We stand for an open democracy. We stand for freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and uh, to be able to have difference of opinions and not just have one narrow path that you have to follow or or risk getting banned and and, and frozen out of the of the of the whole discussion so i, I thought because i've been watching the media on this i've been watching nrk and uh, uh, the program which is called the button which yep. frederick Solvang, and I, i've seen the different guests that they invite there and one of them i was just shocked who was called um Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was an expert. Um, and he said uh, that perhaps what we should do is in this situation is uh, what we really should do is go back to 1948 and look at the creation of Israel in itself. Perhaps uh, that was wrong. Perhaps we should go back there and, <laughs> and one, dissolve the state. <laughs> like the absurd uh, ideas that they... that they. Uh, Which is uh, interesting. I mean, you, you wouldn't hear it about any other state. Only Israel existence is being questioned. And, uh, you know, last week, uh, Oslo municipality was raising uh, the Palestinian flag on 29th of November. Why 29th of November? Which is ridiculous. You, uh, the Norway really cherished very much the role of the the UN. As a country that cherished very much the role of the UN, 29th of November was 1947 was the day of the decision of the UN to have two states, this two-state solution. One is a Jewish one, one an Arab one. We accepted it, the Arab didn't accept it, and now this is the day of solidarity with the Palestinian Solidarity with what? With the fact that this disrespect UN resolution, they went into a war to make sure that the UN resolution is not being accepted, and this is why you raised the flag of the Palestinian over here in the middle of Oslo. The same building that is will be hosting this weekend the Nobel Peace uh, Award. What's the idea behind it? It's a problem. And also, also disappointed in the UN because they voted against a motion condemning Hamas for the atrocities of the 7th of October. I was shocked just to hear that. I, I, I was certain that, of course, you would condemn Hamas atrocities, but they voted, no, we won't condemn that. I believe that the free world democratic countries should ask themselves, why do you continue to sponsor this organization that have been hijacked by non-democratic countries that are using your, basically, you know, using your values and your money to promote their own agenda. When you're looking at the Human Rights uh, Council in Geneva, 60 to 70% of the members, uh, the countries over there are non-democratic countries. And then again, every time the target is Israel. You're looking on organization like uh, UNRWA. And I'm, I'm, I really believe that, you know, what you're doing in order to assist developing countries on anyone, and also the Palestinian is very important. I believe that, you know, when you're supporting the Palestinian educational system or the medical system, this is important. 
but you have responsibility because every Norwegian krona that you're putting over there, this is your money that's going until the end. When you are a factory owner and you make an investment, let's say you make an investment in a car or a company, you want to know that the product that will come out of, of your chain will be a very good car. Now you're putting money on UNRWA. UNRWA, one of the things that they're doing, they are uh, running the educational system in Gaza, in the, in the Judea and Samaria. Kids are going to school. Teachers over there were praising the 7th of October. Textbooks, textbooks are praising the Shahids. And then when you're interviewing the kids, what do you want to do when you'll be uh, growing up? I want to go out there and kill the Jews. Jews, not Israelis. Jews talking about anti-Semitism. Is this is... Was this the goal of the Norwegian government when you are putting your money, your taxpayers' money to UNRWA schools? No. You wanted to have values that will promote peace, coexistence, and solving the problem, the, the issues in the Middle East. Where's the responsibility when you're putting the money? I'm not saying don't put the money. Put the money. But you have responsibility for the outcome of it. And also what is so terrible is that I read just the, the, the past few days that Actually, one teacher associated with that organization was the one kidnapping one of the kids and hiding one of the Jewish kids in their attic or, or somewhere. And he had, I think I read he had 10 other kids and he wasn't feeding the Jewish kid. Yeah, He was just holding him there. So I was hearing it too, and I'm very careful, uh, you know, unless I can have verified stories, I'm, I'm, I'm careful. But the problem is, you know, that we are being so careful to verify each and every case before we are using it. Mm. But when the Hamas is saying, you know, the Hamas, the Ministry of Health in Gaza is saying that, you know, anything that they will say will be automatically published. But when we are saying something, the media will say, uh, prove it. You cannot prove it. This is double standards. Yeah, the double standards because there were, like in Norwegian media, NRK or Vega, when they're writing something, they're... they're <laughs> Their source is like Hamas says or a Palestinian Authority says, and they, they just accept that yeah. w- without further evidence. And then if uh, Israel says something or IDF says, then then they they don't, they don't even use the word says. They say they say claim, yeah. and then they can't even like but the IDF claims, but we can't verify that. Yeah. We have to have a third party source. <laughs> like it's obvious uh, different moral standards and. It's so strange how they can just get away with that too, without an awake public that actually criticizes that. They yeah. just get away with it. Yeah, it's it's um, it's sad. It's frustrating, and you're losing confidence on those institutions that you know acting this way. It's happening here in Norway. It's happening also at the UN. Um, you see seeing UN organization that blaming Israel for everything that the, uh, Hamas will say and accept it as it is. But when Israel uh, is saying, you know, that uh, there was a mass rape over there, brutal rape over there, the UN women are quiet for 50 days and only after a long uh, pressure, they're willing to say that they're alarmed, that they are, uh, there are claims for this and they are alarmed and they will have to investigate it. And then who would investigate it? The Committee of Investigation. Committee of Investigation, there are three members of them. Two of them are anti-Semite. So how can we trust them to come to a real conclusions? And this is not enough because we're submitting evidence for this rape, submitting evidence, and they're ignoring it. We're just saying that they're alarmed. So I try to understand how people can have that double standard. And what I'm thinking is that I've, I've talked to different people on my podcast, Itamar Marcus and Edwin Kuhn and um, uh, Joav Melchior. And we were talking about how people can tend in the West because of postmodernism, because of moral relativism, how people tend to now view the world as, as binary and split into two parts. Like we, we just assume automatically that weak equals good and strong, powerful equals bad. And if you only see the world through that lens, then that is the reality that you see and that the reality that you want to see. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you just look at it from such a superficial image, you see Israel, a oh, strong, modern democracy, as a powerful a military, probably a bad country. And then you see uh, Palestine, oh, they, look, they're so poor, they're just throwing rocks. Uh, poor, oh, they're, they're weak, oh, probably good, the good part. So if that is your worldview, then that explains a lot of what we're seeing. I, I believe, you know, we're living in a, 
age of information, but it's strange. As much as, much as we have more information, we turn to believe only what we want to believe. We're living in some kind of echo chambers and that's it. We don't really know what the facts, and we are not basing ourselves on facts. You're having a world that is best, you know, even even X, the X, the Twitter is too long for them because too many words in Twitter. So they're going to TikTok and this is enough. And you're having this trend right now in the US of youngster that uh, very much uh, glorifying uh, uh, Bin Laden with his uh, let, a letter to America. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what is happening. Uh, so at the end of the day, they don't base them, themselves on facts. All they care is to be trendy. If my friends really uh, said that this is right, so I'll be part of this because this is trendy and I want to be trendy. It's not really, you don't really try to understand really what is happening. Israel is bad, Palestinians are good, no matter what was happening, Hamas is wonderful. You know, and, and, and again, I'm going back to the expression of freedom over here in Norway. Again, I respect the expression of freedom. But not everything that is allowed or illegal, it's moral. So if it's okay, according to expression, uh, freedom of expression, that the leader of Palcom, Lina Khatib, will be saying uh, that uh, what Hamas was doing on October 7 is spectacular, or she can say that uh, Hamas is a freedom of movement like Nelson Mandela, she shouldn't be allowed to say it on Enarco, because this is a public uh, broadcast. She can say it. She can say it in the street, not in the public broadcast, because you are sponsoring this uh, broadcast. And then she shouldn't be allowed to meet your foreign minister. She's allowed to say it, but he shouldn't accept her for a meeting. True, it was a big meeting, but she wouldn't be there. Imagine that uh, any minister over here in Europe will be willing to meet someone that would be praising the Utaya massacre. This is what. This is exactly for us what what, what uh, was happening. Lena Khatib shouldn't be meeting any Norwegian minister. Yes, also we have our own, uh, here in Norway, our own history with terror incidents. Like in 2011, we right. had Anders Bering Breivik, who killed a lot of young people at, um, at a camp called the Utøya. And it's, also, it's almost like uh, if you had an organization filled with lots of Breiviks, yeah. like hundreds of them, uh, coming in here from across the border, killing a lot of kids, babies, women how, how how would anyone expect to support that kind of an organization it's like it's so absurd is I, I want people to listen to this and in norway imagine that those kinds of people just killing civilians just for the fun of killing them and then you want you want the international community to support that kind of an organization it wasn't supported in any case Unless it's Israel. And as I said, you're sending soldiers all the way to Afghanistan to fight Al-Qaeda. And this was okay, and this was understandable, and this was right. But when Israel is protecting itself against those monsters, this is not okay. When Israel is being called to have a ceasefire, Hamas was violating the ceasefire 34 times. Hamas was carrying a terror attack in Jerusalem one day before the ceasefire was over, killing three civilians. Almost nobody was reporting about it, even if they reported it, it was like a very short uh, sentence about it. They are breaking the ceasefire that we've been asked to agree to. No condemnation, no uh, outrage about it, but when we were reacting to their uh, breaking of the ceasefire because they were shooting rockets uh, before 7 a.m. the next morning on Israel, we've been blamed by some in the media over here that Israel broke the ceasefire. So then, you know what? This is not Israel's problem. This is Norway's problem. If you have, uh, again, not all the media, you have wonderful people also in the media, but you have too many outlets that are disrespecting the profession of journalism and disrespecting the readers. So this is not Israel's problem. What do you think about our Prime Minister, Jonas Karstöder's handling of this uh, situation? As I said, we are very much disappointed that uh, we've been criticized for things that we haven't been done uh, already on October 13, uh, for siege, that there was no siege over there. Uh, I believe also that the voting on the starting uh, uh, on the issue of uh, recognizing Palestinian state on the right time and as soon as possible was wrong on this specific timing. We know that this is the Norwegian government position. We know that this is what the, the Norwegian people would like to see. But doing it five weeks after the terror attack of Hamas is like giving a, a prize to the Hamas because people will ask themselves, you know what? 
Why didn't the starting was voting for it on the 30 years after the Oslo Accord? And now after five weeks after the terror, Hamas, of terror attack of Hamas, they're already do, all, all of a sudden doing it. What kind of a message is it, not only to us, what kind of a message is to the Palestinian people in Ramallah? What kind of a message is it to the different capital in the region that, you know what, maybe terror is working? Also, I see all these demonstrations that you have for Free Palestine and their absurd slogans that they scream, like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What, what, what does that entail, just that slogan, from the river to the sea? So that I think a lot of people, if I give them the benefit of the doubt, just just walk around chanting that because they believe that's that's the right thing to mean and say. But if we could explain what they're actually chanting by saying from the river to the sea uh, that Palestine would be free, what, what would that mean in practice? <laughs> that would mean this is uh, of the existence of Israel. Basically, from the river to the sea, this is the place that anyone that really believes in the two-state solution should really wish to have two states. If they're chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, basically they're saying that Israel have no right to exist. It's exactly as rising the flag of the Palestinian on the 29th of November, saying, I'm showing solidarity. Solidarity with what? Solidarity with the Palestinian because the UN have decided that there should be two states over there and we don't support it. This is the meaning of raising the flag of the Palestinian flag on 29th of November, not recognizing Israel's right to exist. Simple as that. There's no any other explanation for this. Also, I've seen, because lately, uh, or up until now, the, um, the demonstrators and the activists with their plaques and their cards have been saying, like, we support uh, the Palestinians, but, but not Hamas. This is not about Hamas. But lately, just a couple of days, I, I've, I've seen um, the leadership of these demonstrations. One guy there was saying that, no, now we also have to support Hamas. People need to show them support. They will appreciate the support. We all need to support Hamas. It's so absurd. I, 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 I sent a message to PST, the uh, safety police yeah. uh, here in Norway, just for him mentioning about it. But what do you think about that kind of development, people walking around supporting Hamas? Uh, but, but he was the citizen of, a citizen of the area, you know, 2015. So probably he's a good guy. You know, we're getting messages that Hitler was right. It's pity that Hitler didn't finish the work. Uh, those kind of messages that we're getting. Um, and again, talking about there's a difference between freedom of, uh, freedom of expression to freedom of incitement. At the end of the day, words can kill. Words are encouraging violence. Uh, and if someone that is saying that we should uh, support Hamas, Basically, he's, he's saying that we should support uh, terrorism. Prime Minister Stowe was saying the first week of the war that Hamas cannot be recognized by but anything as a terror organization. Took a few days. The, the war started on Saturday. On Wednesday, on the starting, Prime Minister Stowe was saying Hamas is a terror organization. What does it mean? What kind of illegal actions that then you are taking against people that are supporting terror organization? Those people that are going, and the same guy was, I guess, the one that was leading the demonstration that was going into Oslo City during the weekend, harassing people that are sitting in a coffee shop. Why does he have the right to harass people? Why he's, why he has better or more rights than those people that are sitting there paying for the coffee? Again, what's happening to the society? And why do people still continue to support them? Like how much evil do they have to proclaim and, and speak before people in Norway start to think for themselves, like, hey, what are we actually supporting here? When does that kind of alarm bell go off in people's minds? And, and you've seen it not only in Oslo, you've seen it in different capitals in, in, uh, in Europe, and you've seen it also in different places in the US. At the end of the day, it's not about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's about your way of life. When you're seeing on 11th of, so, 11th of November, traditional day of respect in the UK of the veteran of the war, the people that were dying in World War I, World War II. And you're seeing such a disrespect to uh, the British traditions of honoring their own people instead taking over by people that supporting uh, Hamas. What does it say? It doesn't say about anything about the, the, the conflict in the Middle East anymore. It says about the fact that people don't respect your own way of life. And again, people sitting over here during weekend, drinking coffee, why should they be disturbed? What's it like for you personally? Do you feel unsafe? Uh, do you get a lot of threats? Uh, is it? Do you feel like there's a risk for your your life? Well, we know 
the death threats on Israelis all over the world those days. Really. I don't feel personally, I don't feel threatened. I'm, I'm being protected over here. I appreciate the very good uh, job of the PST protecting me. Um, Finn mainly said, because I was coming to Norway uh, really in a good intention of uh, uh, improving the relations and cooperation between Israel and Norway. Again, I want to make a difference between the Norwegian public to what you mainly see, uh, again, media, streets, and so on. We're seeing increased support in Israel in the, in the general public. But it's mainly sad on me. I don't, I don't feel uh, threatened. I don't feel that there's a risk to my life. But uh, I feel sad about what's happening. Also, uh, I want to address like the the, the counter arguments that I personally uh, uh, experience a lot. If I say anything like on social media or wherever that is uh, in support of Israel, um, I would like to hear your opinions about uh, about these uh, these arguments that I. I hear is like one thing that I could say is like, look at these atrocities that's happening to Israel and uh, Israel has a right to self-defense. And then one of the things I can hear then is like, how could you be on the side of an occupying state? They are an occupier. And um, j just that word in itself, what do you think about that? Is Israel an occupying state? Let me start with different uh, um labels that Israel is getting that nobody else is getting. And this is this is a deliberate one. Israel is like the Nazis. What you are doing to the Palestinians is worse, worse than what the Nazis did to you. Hitler was right. Uh, you are an apartheid state uh, and you are an occupier. Well, since Israel was regaining independence 75 years ago, three times there were possibilities for two-state solution. Three times we said yes and the Palestinians were the one to say no. Once was really initiated by the UN. We said yes, they said no. Other two times, we initiated it. We were proposing them the two-state solution, and they said no, and still, we are the one to be blamed for this. We are not an occupier. The question, are we willing to have a two-state solution, yes or not? Are we willing to withdraw and to draw a new border? This is a different question. We've been attacked in 1948, and we won. We've been attacked by five different Arab armies, and we won. So the 67 line that everybody is now talking about, the 67 line, this is not a border. This is a ceasefire line that we signed with the uh, Jordanian. You have to remember that what's now the Palestinian claim to be as their own country, Gaza was not part, there was never a Palestinian state. Gaza was part of Egypt, and the Judea and Samaria, what you call West Bank, was part of Jordan. Why didn't give them if it was they really believe in a Palestinian state? Why wasn't it established there in Gaza and the West Bank as they're demanding right now? It wasn't part of Israel. It was part of them. And then in 67, we've been attacked again. And we told Jordan, we told King Hussein, join them, don't join the war. He was believing uh, the president of uh, Egypt, Nasser, that Nasser is really successful and he's on his way to Tel Aviv. So he joined the war and we won the war. So we took over. Uh, what we won in the war. This is this was not a border. There was no Palestinian state. So now I'm saying this is not occupied. We've been attacked. We won the war. We're not going to be apologizing for winning the war. Now, do you ask me if we have the right to be uh, in Hebron? Yes, we have the right because we've been there even before. We've been there in, 19, uh, 20, in 1929. If we lost our right to be in Hebron because in 1929, the Arabs were massacring the Jews in Hebron. And in uh, 1936, the British mandate, the Brits were expelling us from Hebron. So I'm saying, yes, we have the right to be to, uh, in Hebron. If you're asking me, are you willing to leave Hebron in order to have the two-state solution? This is a different question. This is a totally different question, but it doesn't mean that I don't have the right to be there. Another argument I, I hear a lot is, um, how could you support a country that treats um, Gaza as an as an outdoor prison? They look at the blockade; they cut off uh, electricity, water supplies. They they're strangling them. They're not getting uh, giving them anything. Nothing gets into the country. What do you think about that? Uh, well, those that saying it are ignorant. First, let's start with this. Sorry for being so uh, direct, but they are ignorant. We left Gaza in two thousand and five and left it with the government of the Palestinian government in order never to go back to Gaza. 
they've been a corrupted government, a very weak government, and they've been overthrown, not by us, they've been overthrown by a terror organization, Hamas. They've been thrown, you know, from Harris building, they, Hamas was throwing them down, killing them. Until then, Gaza was open. There was no uh, restriction over there. And as you were saying before, imagine that you will have, you know, a terror organization, an extreme uh, organization on your border. Will you keep this border open? Still. It's not that the border was closed. The border was open. People could come to work with Israel in permits. What, what can we do? This is a border. If I will come to your airport right now and you don't want me to come into uh, Norway, you don't have to allow me to come into Norway. You can expel me. So there was a border with three crossing and we were allowing people to come to work in Israel. Seven percent of the water of Gaza, only seven percent of them were coming from Israel. 50% of the electricity of Gaza was coming from Israel. When the war started, on the very first few days, Hamas was shooting us about seven to 8,000 rockets. They were damaging the six out of the seven cables that were producing electricity to Gaza. We are not going to risk our people right now to go and fix uh, during wartime what they were ruining. Water, as I said, only 7% of the water were coming uh, from Israel. Basically, there's no lack of fuel in Gaza. It's being kept by Hamas. There's no like, lack of uh, water in Gaza, but it just don't supply to the people. So basically what Hamas is saying, we are not going to fulfill our responsibility as government to the people. You will supply it during the war because we don't want to. Now, the humanitarian law is saying something very clearly. According to the humanitarian law, we are not supposed to, we are not supposed to supply anything to Gaza. We are only supposed not to prevent others from giving humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Now, not only that we don't prevent it, we are actively uh, uh, cooperating in bringing in humanitarian assistance to Gaza. So anyone that is saying that we were keeping it as an open prison, um, I want to see those countries having a border with a terror organization, jihadist prior organization saying, welcome to my country. Doesn't work this way. It's like a metaphor would be like if Sweden turned on Norway and firing 10,000 rockets at us, and then the whole international community would say, why aren't you supplying them fuel? Yeah, yeah. Like what? <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, you're listening to this different UN organization was saying from the almost first week of the world saying, tomorrow or in two days, we're going to run off of fuel. And they never run out of fuel. And then when we were supplying uh, fuel to the Shifa hospital, 300 liters of fuel, Hamas told them, don't take the fuel, because they wanted to create the crisis. And then they said, uh, but newborn are going to die. We're supplying uh, incubators for the newborn. So we are doing more than we really need to do in order to assist them. Hamas was preventing them, because Hamas wants to use them as a human shield. Hamas wants to see them being killed in order to Israel to be demonized, because Hamas couldn't care less about their own people. Any other army in the world probably will win this war immediately. We are doing it very slowly, very carefully. You know, uh, you saw the war in Syria. They were throwing uh, uh, bombs all over, wiping out cities in Syria. We don't do it. We're sending our kids into uh, Gaza to fight from street to street in order to minimize the casualties. Yes, there are civilian casualties over there. Definitely. The, our war is, war is terrible. It's devastating. But we are risking our, so our soldiers, our youngsters, to go and fight over there in order not to bomb, uh, you know, like carpet bombing as was done in so many different wars uh, out of Israel. Yeah, I want to address that because I think that is a misconception that people, like, at least in Norway, have that they probably think that Israel is just carpet bombing the whole of Gaza indiscriminately and just throwing bombs there. But uh, let's let's clear that up. In 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 what way is the IDF and Israel? bombing when they're shooting bombs into Gaza? Are they picking out s selected buildings or houses? Or, and could you explain a little bit to clear that image up? Well, I'm not sure about, you know, the actual uh, military plan, but what, if you're looking at the beginning of the war, Israel was waiting for a long time, almost, I believe it was at least three weeks, or almost three weeks, 
asking people to leave Gaza City because Gaza City, it was clear that Gaza City is going to be a war zone because Hamas was digging itself under, in an underground city beneath schools, or not schools, schools, mosques, and hospitals. And when we are approaching, we are letting the population to go, uh, to go out of Gaza City in order really to go to shelters and to go to uh, places that will be safer. Every day we had almost uh, four hours of what we call humanitarian pause to allow people to leave this war zone. And obviously we have to take actions in order to reach where Hamas is hiding to try to make sure that they will get out. Hamas was trying to block them from getting out of there because they don't want them to uh, leave, they need them as a human shield. But still it was interesting to see as much as we're getting closer and closer, for example, for the Shifa hospital, the UN organization were getting more and more nervous and they were like warning everybody from a, a catastrophe. Why did they warn everybody from catastrophe? Why did the WHO didn't want us to reach a, a Shifa hospital? Probably from the same reason as Mads Gilberts that was saying that, uh, you know, protecting, uh, look what the Israelis are doing and look what they're doing to hospitals because they knew exactly what we're going to find beneath Shifa that it's going to be headquarter of Hamas. And it was, and it was so strange to see the whole media saying that, no, Israel is just making this up and they don't have proof. And <laughs> it was such a, it was such an antagonism against Israel for even saying that. And, and, and then finally, and now, now they have to accept it, I think, but they're not mentioning it. They're not bringing it up and saying, ah, oh, we were, we were wrong about Israel. Yeah, they, they did have that uh, headquarters underneath there. They're not doing any stories on that. It's not interesting. If you cannot blame Israel, it's not interesting. Yeah. It's, 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 it's uh, again, we were opening our eyes wide open on 7th of October. You see that, you know, if you can criticize Israel, baseless, with no evidence, you will do it. Uh, if Israel proved that what it's saying, it's right, it's not interesting, let's go to the next story. Uh, and it was the same really with uh, uh, Al-Hilal Hospital, that first they blame us, but then, when President Biden was saying, look, we have proof that, uh, independent proof by the Pentagon that this is not Israel. And then you had the French intelligence saying, we have independent proof that this is not Israel. So then the media all of a sudden was saying, look, we have two versions. The Palestinians are saying like this, and President Biden is saying like this. Really? Do you really compare between President Biden and the Hamas? Yeah. That's, uh, where, don't they call that like f fair, false balance? where they absolutely try to find some kind of balance. Look, it's 50-50, they're just, just as bad, they're just as evil. You don't, you have a lot of that picture in the media, like they're trying to portray, yeah, Hamas is bad, but you know, Israel is just as bad. So they're both wrong. It's like that kind of a narrative. But it's coming only when, you know, it's only coming when it's, uh, they cannot really blame Israel for everything. When they can feel that they can blame Israel, they wouldn't try to balance us, balance it. Israel is to be blamed. Israel is the wrong side. Israel is terrible, and then no need to balance it. When you have something that's proving differently, differently, so then you have to say, no, you know, we have two voices, and yes, Hamas is bad, but Israel is well. Um, what do you think about the the attempt to create like moral equivalency or equivalence between the two countries based on the number of deaths? So they they're just counting that like quantifying and saying, look, 1,200 uh, deaths on uh, Israeli side and look how many there. So based on that, we can say that they're both just as bad. What do you think about that uh, approach to the morality of the situation? At the end of the day, it's not about numbers. And I'm saying every human, innocent human life that is being lost is terrible. It's, really, it's devastating. You know, I'm thinking about a child that was losing his mother for him, it doesn't matter how many people die. This is his mother, the only mother that he had. It's, it's, that's it, it's disaster. The question is not about numbers. The question is about the fact that Hamas is attacking uh, civilians on purpose, uh, hitting, as I said, hospitals, uh, kindergartens, school, killing people, uh, bare hands. There was this guy that uh, we have the recording of him calling his father and saying, father, father was killing 10 Jews uh, in bare hands on 7th of October. Uh, tell mother that she should be proud of me. And then Israel is having a legitimate uh, a military activity in order to uproot these uh, monsters from there. And yes, there are unfortunately casualties, innocent casualties as well over there. But you know, this, uh, the law of proportionality is saying that you have to evaluate what was the target, what was the achievement, 
And then what was the result? You don't count the numbers. What you count was really, as I said, the proportion. Was it legitimate uh, target? Were you really acting in the right way? And what we're trying to do is really to minimize as much as possible the uh, civilian casualties. This is why it took us so, so long to go into Gaza. This is why we are telling people, you know, right now we are uh, approaching towards the south, uh, southern part of Gaza. We are publishing maps of blocks and we're telling people, blocks, get out of this block, get out of this block, get out of this block. We are losing the advantage of surprising the uh, enemy in order to save life. And by this, we are risking our own soldier's life just to try to uh, save uh, citizens. Imagine if you'll be acting this way during World War II and uh, you'll be calling, you know, uh, the allies will be saying, you know what, before we're going into Berlin, there might be a lot of casualties when we are landing on the shores uh, really of Europe and approaching towards Germany, so many civilians will be hard on the way. And maybe if we agree to ceasefire, if then there will be, you'll be agreeing to ceasefire, now we will be still under a Nazi occupation. And that's what it's so absurd. Also, if you if you do that quantification, because then you if you if you apply the same morality to the Nazi situation in uh, in Germany and the Second World War, then you could view Germany as the victim because they had so many civilian deaths. Like like we shouldn't have we shouldn't have fought Hitler because there would be civilian deaths in doing so. Yeah, and this this is what we are being asked right now to do. You must agree to a ceasefire because uh, there are casualties. Yes, there are. It's it's terrible. It's pity. Uh, we're trying to minimize them as much as possible. Uh, but if we will agree right now to ceasefire, uh, we're going to stay with Hamas government saying, declaring clearly, openly, that they will repeat 7th of October as much as needed in order to uh, put an end to Israel. But it wouldn't be only Hamas, because we're having Hezbollah on the, our northern border, and everybody is ignoring it. Nobody over here is talking about Hezbollah, attacking us almost on a daily basis from 7th of October already, uh, and not condemning it. And uh, Hezbollah is much stronger. They're having an army of 100,000 soldiers, very well-trained soldiers because they are fighting for five years in Syria, killing a lot of Syrian people over there. And they're having a force called Radwan Force. And Radwan Force is being trained to do exactly what Hamas was doing on October 7, to try to take over Israeli towns in the northern part of Israel. Now in Israel, and everybody's talking about what's happening in Gaza, in Israel we're having right now about a quarter of a million citizens that are being displaced in Israel. It's not only the towns that Hamas have been able to demolish around the uh, southern part of Israel. Five kilometers south of the border from Lebanon, all our towns are being evacuated already for two months in order to save the life of the citizens of it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. I mean, the war in Lebanon was over in 2006. Again, a war that Hezbollah was attacking us. In resolution, UN Resolution 1701, Norway is, is, as I said, cherishing the UN role. Why don't we hear anyone condemning Hezbollah for breaking 1701? You know, 1701 says that no, no military force beside of the Lebanese army can be south of the Litani River. It's only the Hezbollah over there south of the Litani River. They are on our border. Where is Norway? Where is the UN? Where is the international community? You know when you're going to hear about it? If we will take severe steps against Hezbollah and Lebanon, then people will call for a ceasefire. Then people will condemn Israel. Why don't you do it now? Before we have to take action. Are you worried that there will that Hezbollah will open a larger front on Israel and go to a full-scale war? I believe that if they would like to do it, they would do it before, on 7th of October, 8th of October. But as I said, thanks to President Biden, it didn't happen. Right now, they lost the uh, advantage of surprise. So probably they wouldn't like to do it. Second, again, they're serving the, uh, the goals of, of Iran and not the goals of Hamas. Uh, and Iran wouldn't like to uh, see Hezbollah going right now for a full-scale war with Israel because they need them for the day that they will need them, not the day that Hamas want to have them. And the day they will need them can be it can come on different scenarios, but the scenarios that will serve Iran and not serve the uh, Hamas. Nevertheless, this is the Middle East. You never know when things can get out of hand. The war in 2006 started with miscalculation of, of Hezbollah, and Nasrallah was then saying if he would know that this is going to develop to what it developed, 
he probably wouldn't initiate the attack that he was initiating in, in 2006. So you never know what's, how is it going to develop. I hope it's not going to go there. But we cannot continue anymore to agree to a situation that uh, Hezbollah is sitting uh, or standing the, uh, south of the Litani River. Uh, 1701 should be respected. Only two ways. One is diplomatic one, the other one is a military one. We want a diplomatic one, as was decided at the UN, and we expect UN members to call to fulfill a UN resolution. If not, what's the use? Also, I want to touch upon uh, the Palestinian civilians because I, I think that a lot of people try to separate between Hamas, Palestinian Authority, and the civilians. But I had Itamar Marcus on, who is the leader of Palestinian Media Watch on my podcast. And he was talking about there being a, a survey from Avrad, uh, Arabic um, agency that does surveys, who so was actually based in Palestine. Um, and they found that 98% of Palestinians felt proud of their Palestinian identity after the 7th of October. What do you think about those numbers? For us, it's shameful. No one, no human being should be proud on atrocities as Hamas did. No, who can be proud on burning children and, and uh, raping women? But at the end of the day, you know, our fight is uh, with those that are fighting us and not those that uh, hate us. At the end of the day, we will have to have peace with our enemy. And until now, if 98% of the population are proud of what Hamas did, they are probably our enemy. Nevertheless, we wouldn't take any steps against anyone just because of what they believe in and what are their thoughts. But if Hamas is attacking us, and if Hamas is using uh, uh, such atrocities, we have a fight with Hamas, not with the others. It's interesting, on the contrary, to see the reaction of the Arab population of Israel. 70% of them, more than 70% of them, feel uh, the Israeli identity wasn't strong as it is until now. Uh, this is the highest level of identity, of the identification between the Arab Israelis with the country as a country, because what they've seen, that for Hamas, they are also a target. We, you had so many casualties uh, and so many deaths among uh, Muslims during the Hamas attack, and they knew that they are Muslim. There was a case that a Bedouin woman, you couldn't get wrong, she was totally dressed in a Muslim uh, uh, dress, with covering her with a hijab, and the husband was telling them, we are Muslim. So they told them, you are worse than the Jews. So basically, um, it's an interesting process in Israel. Uh, you're seeing Jews, Muslims, and Christians together, realizing that we are one nation working together for the same goal, for the well-being of the country. Uh, and it's an interesting process, as I said. Yeah, because I think that that's important to communicate because people who hasn't looked into this situation, doesn't know a lot about Israel, thinks that Israel is just a nation of only Jews. But that's not true. There are lots of Arab people, Muslim, uh, Christian, probably uh, Jewish people. I saw a photo just the other day of, from an IDF uh, camp where a, a Muslim soldier, IDF soldier, was praying next to a Jewish soldier who was also praying through their different gods, but in harmony and in friendship together. Like this is an important picture to to present of Israel that is actually a place where you can be safe, you can be a Muslim, be safe, you can be Jewish, you can you can thrive, you can have a career, you can work, you can be a woman and drive a car. You can also do that in Saudi Arabia now. Yeah. So okay, kudos to them. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a place of diversity. Uh, because I wanted to ask you, what does it mean to have an uh, Israeli identity? What uh, what are Israeli values, and what does it mean to be an Israeli? Being an Israeli is, first of all, believing in democratic state and being able to uh, aspire for everything that you want to be as long as it's according to the law, which means that you're being seen... Israel is considered to be the startup nation. And you're seeing so many of us now with no connections to what uh, our religion is. We're trying really to achieve those ach achievement, academic life, research and development, startup, uh, Everything that has to do in being excellent and trying to achieve for new creations. And we're doing it together. Jews and Muslims and Christians together. 
Um, you know, we used to say that, you know, the, the, the skies are the limit, but even the skies are not the limit anymore because you're having so many joint ventures, Israel, I mean, is Jews and Muslims together in uh, space uh, technologies. Uh, when we had the first delegation coming, the first official delegation coming from United Arab Emirates to Israel, it was during COVID time. Uh, and we received them at the Israeli airport because if they'll come to Israel, they have to be under quarantine. So all the ceremony was at the airport without them officially coming to Israel. And we had one exhibition for them at the, uh, on the runways of the airport because <laughs> no traffic, no air traffic almost. It was on space technologies. And one of the, the uh, youngsters that were presenting over there was a Muslim, young Muslim from Nazareth, uh, that, uh, showing her... Uh, it was some kind of a new initiative that we was, she was having on space technologies. And, and this is Israel. We believe in democracy, we believe in freedom, and we believe in go, go and accomplish yourself and, and contribute to what you can contribute. And it's, you know, we've been blamed to be in a apartheid state. We having a our party in the parliament with uh, uh, nine members out of 120. We having a Supreme Court judge that is Muslim. You having uh, so many doctors in hospitals that are Muslims. Uh, probably 50% of the people in the pharmacies in Israel are Muslims. And you, we are living together. We're just living together. We had until recently our captain of the national team in football was a uh, Muslim. Uh, our youngsters in uh, Brazil in the World Cup until the age of 19 or 20, I don't remember. It was a beautiful game. We were beating Brazil 3-2. Uh, we finished, uh, I believe, number three. We were in the world. First goal was by a Muslim player. The second one by a, a Bedouin players, And the third goal by a Jewish player. And this is Israel. We're living all together. And as I said, what was happening on 7th of October, I have a friend. His cousin was murdered over there. He's a Muslim. His cousin was murdered over there. His cousin was a medic. And there were six medics over there, five Jews. The other one was Muslim. And they were escaping with the ambulance. And they told the, the five Jews were telling the, the Muslim medic, were telling them, come with us, escape. let's escape. He said, no, I speak Arabic. I'll stay and I'll treat the, the wounded. They wouldn't touch me because I'm a Muslim. They murdered him. They murdered him. So I talked to my friend and he said, you know, it's devastating, but we are proud of him because he was showing exactly what we are educating our kids to. He was showing his commitment for the coexistence between Jews and Muslims. And when you're talking about really what's happening in Israel, it's interesting to see, you know, we are almost in Christmas time. Only country in the Middle East that number of Christians is growing all the time, steadily growing, is in Israel. When we've been in Bethlehem, there was a safe Christian community living in Bethlehem. The numbers dropped over there only when Israel left because they were oppressed by the Palestinian uh, Muslims, not by us. When you're talking about uh, uh, ethnic cleansing, you're having 20% uh, uh, of the Israeli populations are Arab. When you're looking on Arab countries, almost all of the Jewish communities were expelled in 1948. Ethnic cleansing was happening in the region against Jews. Not in Israel, not in Israel. We are marking on 29th of November, the days of the uh, uh, expulsion of the Jewish communities of the Arab countries. More Jews were expelled from Arab countries in 1948 than Arabs that were escaping from Israel. More Jewish refugees from Arab countries in 1948 than Arabs that were escaping uh, from Israel. And they, they have been a loyal citizens of the country. In Iraq, they were living for uh, 2,500 years, 1,000 years before Islam, and they've been expelled over there just for, for being Jews. The Arabs that have been in Israel, they, they run away because they've been attacking us and we won the war. That was the reason, not because they were Arabs because they're attacking us and they lost the war and they're afraid and they run away. Not like the Jews, the Jews that were living in different countries, Arab countries, have been expelled just for their religion. And the world doesn't see it and the world doesn't get it. And if you can blame Israel, it's good. And if you can not blame Israel, as I said, it's not interesting at all. 
Another Israeli value that I just came to think about is that you take care of each other. Because you had uh, some years ago, I believe it was 2014, where you had an Israeli soldier who was captive and you you actually um, dismissed 1,000 um, uh, inmates in Israel, Palestinians, uh, was, in, yeah. in exchange for this one IDF soldier. Yeah, it was it's it was a bit earlier. Uh, I don't remember when was it, but uh, one of those more than one thousand terrorists that were released was Yechia Sanwar, the the current leader of Hamas. He was he was not only you know in Israeli prison. He got very sick with cancer. We saved his life. He is now back in Gaza, and he's the one behind uh, masterminding this attack. And you're seeing also now, and, and I'm happy that you asked this question, you know, uh, people are saying, fine, you are releasing uh, Israeli kids, hostages from Hamas, and giving back also some uh, Palestinian kids from Israeli prison. You cannot compare between the two. First of all, those are, we are talking about young kids, three years old, four years old, very young kids. Compare to minors. They are not kids. Fine, they're 16, they're 17, but they've been arrested for murder attempt, for throwing Molotov cocktails. If someone over here in Norway, a minor will be trying to stab someone else for death, you'll arrest them too. They will be also in quarantine or in prison. There's no comparison between the two. I think it's an important point to address because a lot of people in Norway are saying that also as a counter argument to Israel saying, look at IDF, they're arresting kids and throwing them in jail and uh, painting a picture like you're just indiscriminately going into Gaza and just grabbing some kids and arresting them. That's that's the image that you get. But they're actually, uh, first of all, they're in the school system. They're taught like if you see a Jew, go and kill him almost like not even almost as literally. That's what they're taught. And then you have these situations, that I've also seen them on video, where you have young kids, 16, 17, grabbing knives and just trying to act, attack Israelis. And what are you supposed to do? Like, how, how do you handle that situations when you have p- people under 18 kids and doing these kinds of things? Are, are they brought to a court? And, and uh, how do you handle it? Sure, they, bring, they are being brought to a court, like in any other country. I mean, if, if you will have minors over here, uh, involved in a murder attempt, you'll bring them to court and you'll judge them. That's, that's the right of society to be protected. Uh, and we've seen those that have been arrested. I mean, the decision of the government was not to release anyone that has blood on their hand. What does it mean, blood on their hand? That they were successful in their attempt to murder and they've been up to, uh, being able to murder. But uh, all of them were involved in in. Uh, terror actions, successful or not successful, but those that were not successful have been released. But they're trying to stab people. They're throwing Molotov cocktails. Those things killed. The, the, the issue was that they were not successful. This is why we released them. People are walking around thinking that it's just innocent kids, like, like Israel is just grabbing them to be cruel yeah. and evil. And, and that, that is what, when I'm th- saying that, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, we should also address how people view Israel as as Israel's actions now towards Gaza is one of vengeance and of uh, trying to get revenge. Like people, I think a lot of people think that that is what's happening. But obviously Israel is trying to get Hamas. It's not, it, it doesn't seem to me like an act of vengeance and of revenge. And, I guess that in any as in any other society after terrible attacks on the 7th of October, I guess that some people in the population of Israel would like to have an event. I guess some of the people. The army and the government has an, a very clear goal. Two goals. One is to release the hostages. Second, to uproot uh, Hamas uh, capabilities. When you're talking about Hamas capabilities, to eliminate them, also to uh, two goals. One of them is to eliminate them as a military power. Second is to eliminate their government capabilities. It's not about killing all of Hamas. It's not about killing anyone. If Hamas tomorrow will say, fine, that's it, we live in Gaza, the war is over. We have no reason to be there. Um, we're not enjoying the situation. We don't want to risk our people. We don't want any innocent people to die on the Palestinian side. You know what? We don't even want uh, all Hamas people to be uh, killed. This is not our goal. Our goal is to make sure that we don't leave 
next to our border, behind the fence, with the government of a terror organization that is capable of doing and saying that they will repeat what they are doing in 7th of October. That's the goal. And we don't hear enough the calls for Hamas to cease hostilities and to give the power to someone else and to uh, dismantle the government. And we don't hear those calls enough at all. We don't hear it for uh, to Iran. Because at the end of the day, masters of Hamas is Iran. Can I ask you about the... Um So terrible. There are still hostages, uh, Israeli hostages. How many are left in, in Gaza still? There are still 134 hostages, among them 17 uh, women and children. Because um, you were able to get some hostages freed. I, I assume that must be terribly difficult negotiating with Hamas. And this was done through Qatar, I, I read. Mm-hmm. Uh, are they like a neutral kind of objective third part? Or why through Qatar? Well, Qatar has a big influence of, uh, on uh, Hamas. They are the ones that were coming with the cash money in suitcases uh, whenever Hamas needed money. Uh, we are wrong, uh, all of us, to treat Hamas as a mafia organization. Uh, whenever you don't want them to uh, attack you, you give them money. Uh, this is an organization, this is not a mafia organization. Uh, and Qatar is playing... Uh, very tricky uh, role for many years in different places, not only between us and Hamas, and uh, enough to see Al Jazeera, you know, that uh, some people over here quote Al Jazeera as a legitimate uh, uh, media organization, which they are not. There was a, a clip that I saw this week of an Al Jazeera a reporter trying to interview someone in Gaza, a Gaza residence, And the guy is saying, uh, God will make Turkey and uh, Qatar pay for what is happening over here. So the Al Jazeera reporter is pushing him because he's not serving the right narrative. (laughs) So the guy is coming back to him and the the Al Jazeera reporter is again pushing him. This is not the media. This is, you want to have a narrative and this is what you're doing. And Al Jazeera, when you're following it in the West in English, it's bad enough. But when you follow Al Jazeera in Arabic, they are worse. They are serving the Hamas narrative. So, uh, yes, we want to free our hostages and anyone that can do with it, uh, we will uh, definitely be uh, looking forward for any assistance that anyone that can contribute and Qatar can contribute because they're having good connections with Hamas. Uh, but I cannot say that Qatar is playing a positive role in general in the Middle East. And enough to remember that the Gulf countries were uh, uh, basically boycotting Qatar for quite a few years, uh, not too long ago. Because... Um I saw that just the other day there were supposed to be a lot of women and children, I think, I believe also, who were supposed to be released. And then last minute, Hamas says, no, 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 we can't do this. So we're pulling out. Uh, it must be so difficult to try to have some kind of negotiations uh, with this kind of organization which just last minute just throws the ball away and, and then goes somewhere else uh, in the process. We know Hamas. We cannot trust Hamas. Nobody can trust Hamas. We know that when we were were coming to this agreement, it was a deal with the devil. (laughs) But you're trying to get uh, your people out of there. You want to have your kids and women out of there. So you're coming to an agreement that you know that is not good. But if as much as you can get out of it, you'll try to get out of it. But this is a deal with the devil. You don't trust it. I'm trying to get the best out of it. And um, I really hope you get your hostages out of there. Thank you. Uh, are there any countries who are supporting you in that, giving you competence? Are the United States is trying to support you in negotiations? I don't, I'm not sure how much you can say or not, but just trying to get a general idea of uh, how many or which countries are actually in, in this with you and standing there with you. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we're hearing different declarations from different governments, including over here, you know, that everybody is talking to everybody, but uh, talking is not enough. The countries that really, really are involved in in a practical way in being able to promote those things is Qatar, Egypt, and the U.S. Those are the countries together with us as one side for it. At the end of the day, it's a terror organization. They will do nothing out of a goodwill. So you need to press them and to, to pressure them. And I really believe that uh, what is not being done and what should be done is to call uh, Iran and to make it clear to Iran that if the hostages are not going, going to be released immediately without conditions, Iran is going to pay a price. There's no reason 
that uh, Iran will have a normal relations uh, or normal exchange uh, with the world if Iran is not making sure that Hamas will resist them. Hamas have no way to exist without the money from Iran, without the training from Iran, without the supply of, of weapon from Iran. So Iran should be called and said, we expect you, we demand from you to instruct, instruct Hamas to release the hostages now or you will bear a price too and it's not happening. I see. So when you're negotiating through Qatar with Hamas, you're not actually negotiating with Hamas, you're negotiating with Iran. No, Hamas can call and have their own decisions as long uh, they are being left to call their own decisions. But this is not enough. Because at the end of the day, if Iran will give them instructions, they will have to follow. They will have to follow, but they don't do it. And nobody is asking Iran to do it. So as long as Iran is not being pressured, Iran has no reason to, pray, to have put pressure on Hamas. They are very happy with what Hamas is doing. They are very happy with what Hamas is doing. And this is why they should be also uh, addressed and being asked to uh, demand those things. Not, not ask to, but demand to. I also want to address, because uh, that's a different counter-argument that I see the last few days on social media, it's so stupid, is that people are saying that, look, uh, Hamas are so are the good guys. Look how happy the hostages are. They're even giving them high fives and hugs when they're they probably have a good relationship. They were probably fond of each other and got good friendships. And uh, are you so stupid? Uh, don't you see that this is propaganda? And, and what what do you comment on that? Those, those things. <laughs> Not more much than what you're saying. It's stupidity. I mean, the people who are uh, under almost 50 days uh, being kept as hostages in terrible conditions. A lack of food, lack of water, not allowed to get shower for 50 days. And then uh, your captures are telling you, now you have to wave. So they're waving. What are they going to do? They still, when they are going out there, they don't know if they're going to be released. They have no idea that they're going to be released. They don't know that, you know, Hamas is not playing with them. They're using psychological warfare against them for 50 days. Uh, you know, there was this uh, mother with twins, three years old twins, they took her, uh, one of the kids, three years old, 10 days away from her. What does she know? What does she know? And then the, the, one of the mothers was asked to write a letter of praising of Hamas. What can she do? And anyone, anyone that doesn't understand it, it's a shame. It's a shame that we're living in a world that people really willing to believe that Hamas is wonderful. How come they became so wonderful after raping those women, burning those kids? What do you mean that they are wonderful? It's ignorance. You know what? Stupidity is, is, is a compliment for those that are saying that Hamas is so wonderful. And also, the, the woman that you were talking about, is that the woman who had like red hair and the, the kids also were red haired? Uh, and they were not released on Hamas they, now claiming that they are uh, killed. Uh, that's so terrible. Because I remember the video of them. It's yeah, and, and, and they've been kidnapped. You've seen they've been kidnapped when they are uh, not harmed. So how come they've been killed when they are in captivity? Mm -hmm. We're having... Uh, quite a few hostages that we know that have been murdered uh, while they've been in captivity. The wonderful Hamas uh, freedom fighters, yeah. Why do you think they took uh, captives in order to get their, their, their terrorists out of jail, out of Israel? Was that, do you think? This is part of it, but you're seeing uh, the new demand. The new demand is saying that we will be willing to release the rest of the hostages only when the war will be over. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is some kind of insurance for them that, you know, uh, they, ho they hoped uh, that Israel would be willing to, uh, to seize the war uh, just for the return of the hostages. And I'm saying, you know, it's like, imagine that you have a neighbor, you're showing a wall in an apartment building with a neighbor. The neighbor is coming into your house, raping your wife, killing her, killing your son and kidnapping your daughter. And he says, you know what? Uh, I'm willing now uh, to give you back your daughter as long as you don't uh, take any actions against me. This is what we are being asked to do. It's an impossible situation. Yeah. Well, it's so strange also that they took captives. Why would they kill them during captivity if their value to them was to be able to have a bargaining card? Two of them were probably uh, murdered when we were approaching towards the Shif hospital. 
there were keeping hostages in Shif Aspatul and probably two of them that they were not being able to escape fast enough. When taking them, it will be, uh, you know, uh, risking them. So they killed them uh, next to the Shif Aspatul. Others, we still don't know. But we know that uh, this week we've been able to pronounce, I believe, about four or five of them uh, as being uh, killed. And uh, some of them maybe because of lack of treatment, you know, that they've been wounded and lack of treatment. Uh, one of them that is still alive and she was returning to Israel, she was uh, operated by a vet. Um, some of the, I think it was the Thai workers that were saying that they had to eat uh, toilet paper in order not to starve. So absurd and terrible to listen to. And yeah. also, um, so I'm going to ask you, um, just to be able to treat people like that, what, is, what does that say about, it's like you've, you've resigned from humanity. It's like you're not even, it's not even within the realm of humanity to be like that towards another. I, yeah, I, I listened to Ben Shapiro on the Daily Wire in the United States and he, he had a monologue where he said that, I, I never think that I would say this, but Hamas is actually worse than the Nazis during the Second World War because of at least the Nazis tried to cover up what they did, and try to hide it, while Hamas is actually GoProing the whole thing, proud of it and sharing it with the world, and calling home and look, Mom, I, I killed 10 Jews today. Aren't you proud of me? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I wouldn't compare between the two things, but you know, at the end of the day, Taking photos of it and being part of it, this is part of the terror. Um, like the rape was part of a terror. This was intentional rape in order to create fear, uh, humiliate. Uh, and this is what they want to spread around the world because they believe that it's going to serve them in front of other really uh, players in the region. Uh, but put aside the Israelis for a moment. What does it say about them that they're willing to make their own people suffer, to sacrifice their own people, to keep them as a human shield. Because when we were asking the, the popula Palestinian population to leave Gaza City before we are entering, they were trying to prevent them from uh, escaping Gaza City. They were beating them at the beginning with sticks. Then they were shooting on some of them. Uh, one of those convoys that are escaping from Gaza City, uh, they blew up a, a, a landmine killing people in order to make them sure, to make sure that they don't escape because they needed them over there as a human shield. What does it say about them when they're treating their own people this way? And I guess this is coming because of the jihadist uh, ideology. You know, who cares? There's many of them that will kill as long as it's serving the idea. It seems like a main difference between Hamas and the Israeli people is that Israel celebrates life while Hamas celebrates death. This is why we're going to win. This is why we're going to win because they are totally wrong. We want to live life, good life, normal life, successful life. But when we are being under threat, we are united and we are willing to do everything that is needed to protect our way of life. And since uh, we have so much to gain, we will fight for it as long as it takes. And they are sacrificing their own people. It's not that, you know, the population in Gaza necessarily will join them. Even if the population in Gaza is happy with what was happening, they're not necessarily going to join them. Now, you're seeing two different worlds right now in Gaza. Those that are above the ground, the population, those that are really uh, needs the assistant. And Hamas that is hiding beneath, uh, in the tunnels, in the headquarters beneath uh, Gaza City or in Khan Yunus. And just in some places, there's already a chaos because Hamas is taking over uh, many times on the humanitarian assistance trucks uh, and the people are not happy with this. So you'll be seeing some places protest or, or, or uh, declarations against Hamas. In Israel, you wouldn't hear it because we are all united right now as you haven't been united for so long because they are not threatening... They are not threatening a, a one organization. They're threatening our existence as a nation our way of life, and we are not willing to accept it. And rightfully so. And also I think that uh, if you zoom out and look at the situation is with Israel, but if we would cheer on Hamas and, and allow them to somehow win, then 
then who's next? Like th that's a green card to Europe, to to the United States for, the, for telling these kinds of terrorist organizations like, look, you can do whatever you want. It'll have no consequences. We'll even cheer you on. This is what I was saying, you know, when you ask me about anti-Semitism, it's about anti-Semitism. I've said, yes, there's a big wave of anti-Semitism around the world, but what's happening in Israel, it's not about... It's not about Israel, it's not about anti-Semitism, it's about jihadism. And if you will allow it to, to happen there, you know, some Israelis are saying it, then the West is next. It's, it's about the idea of jihadism. And you're seeing it's happening, you know, when people are cherish, uh, cheering for Hamas over here in capitals of Europe. What does it say not about Israel? What does it say about the European way of living? What does it say about European values? There are those that are cheering in the street in a violent way. In a violent way, in a way that is against your values, basically they are challenging you, they are not challenging Israel. Uh, Russia. Well, what do you feel like Russia's role in this situation is? I'm not sure, you know, they definitely don't have a role, deliberate role over there, but uh, we've seen Russia hosting Hamas delegation after the war started over there, and this is not a good message. Uh, and definitely there are different players as uh, Russia and Iran that are very happy with what is happening because before, you know, all the focus and all the uh, light was on them, both Russia and Iran, because of Ukraine and because of the Iranian assistance to Russia in with drones attacking uh, uh, Ukraine. So definitely they are very happy that the focus right now is only in, on Israel and all the blame is against Israel and they are, can continue to do whatever they're doing and without really the attention of the world. Uh, what is the role? Mainly, mainly I will say that we have to follow and to try to see how much misinformation is coming and how many lies are coming on the social media. And this is a problem. Social media is, is being uh, manipulated with uh, players that sitting in countries that are not really democratic countries and enjoying really to manipulate the West. Uh, to wrong thoughts and ideas, uh, and Israel is suffering from it definitely. Like TikTok, which is uh, basically a Chinese company, and I, I get the feeling that this is about a tactic that you call uh, divide and conquer. Like you're trying to split open you know, Europe and, and get people angry at each other and get more polarization in Europe and yeah. the United States, and divide and conquer gives you some leeway to try to affect countries in, in an easier manner? I, I believe that, you know, the values of the free world are, are important and they are the right values and democracy is the right way of, of governing. The problem is that you're having so much non-democratic societies and countries that are using the values and the practice of the free world against the free world. And you know, someone was telling me over here about Hamas, but Hamas won the elections. I said, yes, but the Nazis also won the elections. Does it make them legitimate? Uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, they, they are trying to manipulate the sorts of the people, trying to polarize societies in order to serve them, we should be much more aware of this and we should really stand as one, the free world, in front of all those non-democratic countries instead of letting them play with our minds. Instead of going to this lunatic idea that is happening through TikTok right now in, in different countries with the letter to America and Bin Laden was so wonderful. Uh, why won't we have next year uh, Bin Laden Day? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah, And also, um, before we wrap up here, what a... What, what do you see as a solution to all this? What, what's the end game? How, how, where, where would you ideally, as Israel, end up in this situation? What's the, what do you think the solution is? Let's say you you get to defeat Hamas and rid the world of Hamas. Then what? Then what happens? How do you, how do you get a sustaining situation that you can live with? Well, we left Gaza in two thousand five in order not. To ever to go back to Gaza. We have no intentions to be in Gaza. Our only intention is to get rid of the Hamas government and to ensure that the one that will be in Gaza, it's not a terror government. In order to reach the, this day after, and let's say, let's say that I don't have much of a difference between the Norwegian government position about what should happen in the day after to my position, let's say so. 
you cannot reach this day after unless you are put Hamas, unless you make sure that there's no Hamas government, because if you want to have a civilian, peaceful government in Gaza, you cannot reach it without getting out of Hamas. So first, let's finish with the war. First, let's agree that this is a common goal of the free world. If you want to reach the day after, if you want to reach a free government over there, a peaceful one, stable one, let's agree that you, we, we have the same goal right now to uproot the terror government that's existing over there. And the day after, as I said, Gaza should be without Hamas, and we don't have any intentions to be there. There should be something that will uh, ensure peaceful, flourishing society over there. How is it going to be? It's too early. We didn't finish this. Uh, we didn't win the war yet. Mm. And uh, with the hostages, I really hope that you get the freedom. I, I, I read somewhere that Netanyahu in the early days uh, wanted to go for a military solution to just get in there and get them out somehow militarily, but that, um, but that they discussed it and, and wanted to go for uh, negotiations instead. And I really hope that you're successful with those negotiations and that you, that you get them out. That, that must be a main priority, I, I assume. It's a main priority. And you know what Netanyahu thought or we didn't thought, it's nobody can know because, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, as I said, with the devil, organization like this, whatever you say publicly, it doesn't mean that this is really what you want to achieve. You don't, you don't uh, play with uh, open hands. You don't play cards with open hands. So <sighs> Netanyahu is in a position that he has to calculate very carefully what is the right way to uh, play the game in order to achieve the best result for the hostages. Uh, we proved in the past that uh, whenever we can uh, release our hostages, uh, we will do our best. If we have no other choice, we'll use force for it. Definitely we'll use force for it. But what never Netanyahu is saying on record, uh, don't forget this is part of the game. Uh, it's a mind game between sick minds of uh, Hamas and uh, Sinwar, and we have uh, somehow to, to play the game in a way that we will achieve the best result for our hostages. We want them back, we want them safe, we want them alive. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video that were videos that coming out of Israel when the hostages were coming back home. Hundreds of people waiting in the streets with the uh, Israeli flag, so happy for them. This is a moment of joy for us, and it's a moment of a great sadness to know that so many of them are still being kept as hostages. Really hope that they get home safe, and I, sure. I pray for your hostages that are still, still there in Gaza, in the tunnels or wherever they are. Um, and I, I thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for speaking to me, and I wish all the best to you and your family and to the Israeli people. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and I'm wishing uh, that really the Israeli region uh, relations will know how to overcome uh, the disagreement and the uh, differences that we have between us right now uh, with the governments. I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you.